he is often called the father of humanism. And humanism is key to understanding the whole Renaissance mindset, the philosophy of the Renaissance, which is based upon the dignity of the individual. Um, and that recuperation of a classical past. Again, this is how we divide history, or rather how Petrarch divides history. You've got the classical past, which everything is glorious and wonderful, and you've got the bit in the middle, which is fairly rubbish, and then you've got the Renaissance, which is the rebirth of the classical past. Um, a lot of this is down to Petrarch's division of history. Now, <coughs> as Dante has his Beatrice, so Petrarch has Laura, although the pretentious pronunciation is Laura. Um, and he writes a lot of poems for her when she's alive and then she dies, and he continues to be in love with her until he dies. Um, now, but she's not only a person, she is an allegory. She signifies the poetic laurel. The laurel is what the poet is given um, to show that he has succeeded, that he is a good poet. Um, you get crowned with laurels, like a Caesar. Um, now, this was a classical uh, process, a classical procedure, uh, but it was revived in the late medieval period. Petrarch himself was crowned with laurels upon the Capitoline Hill in Rome in 1341. Um, the key thing that we want to have for is Petrarchan paradox. This is an important influence on the language of poetry for centuries. Um, we're often associated with paradox or antithesis or oxymora, um, where you have contraries being brought together, freezing fires, pleasurable pains, and things like that. So how are we doing? Yeah, right. So here's an example. If it is not love, what then do I feel? But if it is, by God, what kind of thing is love? If good, why is the harsh effect so deadly? If bad, why is every torment so sweet? If willingly I burn, why do I complain and lament? If the illness is agreeable, why complain? O oh, living death, or oh, delightful misery, how have you such hold over me if I may not consent to it? And if I consent, it is wrong to lament. Between two warring winds and a sinking ship, I find myself on a high sea without a tiller, so bereft of wisdom, so lame with error, that I myself do not know what I want, and I freeze in midsummer, burn in winter. That's the, <coughs> that becomes the traditional language of love, of poetic love, in the early modern Renaissance period. Um, so if you look at the line there, O viva morte, o dilettoso male, living death, uh, sweet pain, so many poets write in this way. And it's not that they're two contraries, it's that you can feel, Petrarch always argued that the one mind in the same exact moment can hold two different and contrary thoughts. Um, and so the Petrarchan paradox is not just a nice cosmetic thing to do, it's saying that we don't necessarily always think one thing or want one thing. We might sometimes want what's bad for us and know that it's bad for us, but we want it anyway. Um, so Petrarch is always torn in this way. Whereas Dante is saying, this is what love is, and love is terrible, and he gives that allegorical personification of love. Petrarch is saying, I don't even know what it is I'm feeling. Is this what love is? I don't know. It's a much more confused thing. But it, the, the thing with the sonnets is that the confusion of your emotions are collected by the order of the form. Or the, rather, the speaker's emotions. Again, it's, in many ways, it's, a, in many ways, it's that dramatic performance of the lover. Um, now this is a, this poem is in fact translated by Chaucer um, in the late 14th century. Chaucer, um, because he's the father of English poetry, but he's also uh, a, one of the best translators around. Chaucer not only translates Dante, he translates Petrarch, he translates Boccaccio, he translates the three big figures of the early Italian Renaissance. Um, and so he's key in that respect. But Chaucer does not translate the sonnet form, which is an important point to make, because a sonnet is sonnet form. He translates this poem, but he doesn't copy the 14 lines. He translates it into three stanzas of Rhyme Royal. Um, you can see this in your Norton anthology. It's called The Song of Troilus. So Petrarch's structure. The octave of Rime Crociate, ABBA, ABBA. The sestet here is composed of two tercets, each ending in an E rhyme. CDE, DCE. Although, again, as with all the other Italian poets, Petrarch varies his sestet throughout. Um, you know, he writes 366 poems in his sequence, so he can afford <coughs> to do it here and there. Um, the volta in this particular poem is not very emphatic, although it is elsewhere. Um, I use this poem as an, as, a, as an instance of Petrarch language, really. 
Um, the opening of the sestet seems to continue the questioning theme of the octave um, before moving to that image of the ship. <coughs> and that image of the ship, the image of the ship is um, an illustration of tenor and vehicle, which I mentioned earlier. So the tenor is, I'm all over the place. The vehicle is, I'm a ship at sea and I'm sinking. Um, emphasis upon the unstable mind of the lover by means of antithesis, oxymoron, and paradox. Love and desire, and this is a crucial thing about the sonnet, as a means of self-analysis. There are no psychiatrists in the early modern period. And so what you do is you kind of analyse yourself through putting your thoughts down in a poem, and you pull it to bits. It's what um, a literary form called an anatomy. Anatomy, as we think of it now, is just pulling it apart. That's human anatomy. That's sort of looking at bits and pieces inside. And it is linked to that. Um, but anatomy, you can anatomise your own mind. You can take it to pieces. Or the speaker in the sequence can anatomise his own mind. Um, I'm not just being sort of overly sort of um, sexist or anything here, but usually the sonnet, people who write sonnets are men. Um, and they elevate the, sort of the women they love or the, the perfected figures. Although some women do write sonnets later on as well. Thomas Wyatt. Look at him. <coughs> He's the first person to bring the sonnet form to England. Um, who does he look like, do you think? Hamlet's father. A bit like Hamlet's dad, yeah. <laughs> Historical figure. Henry VIII. Henry VIII, yes, exactly. Big beard, hat at jaunty angle. Vaguely looks like he wants to fight you. Um, that's Holbein's sketch. And look at that sort of, look at that looking askance. That kind of, it's, it's the equivalent of, are you trying to take my picture? Well, of course, this seems a very odd thing to do because Holbein obviously would have had to sit there for hours. Um, so why just sitting there gradually getting more annoyed? Um, but yeah, he, he dresses like Henry, because that's what you do, because Henry was the superstar of the court. So if you wanted to be a player in court, you had to try and dress like Henry. So big beard, nice hat, furs. Wise, again, central, bringing the sonnet form to England. Now, this is his translation of a poem by Petrarch. Again, if you're going to write a sonnet, you'll translate Petrarch for the most part. Um, so Una Candida Cerva, um, a white doe appeared upon the green grass. Um, so... In Petrarch's poem, I'll just translate it quickly. Um, a white doe upon the green grass appeared to me with two <coughs> horns of gold, signifying the medieval practice of women wearing their hair in kind of horns. Um, between two rivers in the shadow of a laurel tree, um, when the sun was at its highest point. Um, it was such a, a wonderful sight that I abandoned everything else to follow this deer, um, just as the miser sort of sweetens his misery by following or seeking treasure. Um, but... Nessun me toki, do not touch me, was written around her neck with diamonds and topazes um, because it pleased Caesar to make me free. Um, at this point, the sun was in its highest point in the sky. Um, my eyes were weary with looking but not satisfied um, when I fell into the water and she disappeared. Right, very imagistic, very allegorical. The cherva, the deer, the doe is in fact Laura. Um, it's mentioned right there, in the shadow of a laurel tree. Um, and it's also something about the evanescence of poetic inspiration, because it vanishes before you can grasp it, because Laura is, of course, the poetic laurel also. Now, Wyatt's version of this is very different indeed. Whoso list to hunt, I know where is in hind, but as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore, I am of them that fathers cometh behind, yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, that as she fleeth afore, fainting might follow. I leave off, therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. Who lists her hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain, and grain with diamonds and letters played, there is written about her fair neck round about, nolle mi tangere, for Caesar's I am, and wild what to hold, while I seem tame. Right. Um, it's a, an adaptation rather than a direct translation of Petrarch. Um, anyone know anything about Thomas Wyatt at all? Anyone come across him? Um, yes? No? Yes, absolutely. Thomas Wyatt was allegedly Anne Boleyn's boyfriend before Henry VIII stepped in. So, in this poem, he's describing a deer. But he has to leave off because he's one of those that cometh far behind. He is not an elevated figure. Um, so as he tries to draw, she runs away, but he's kind of helping drawn back to her. 
And of course at the end, do not touch me, for Caesar's I am. Caesar, Henry, there's the possibility to read that relationship into the poem, as many people have done. Of course, Wyatt's not going to say this directly because Henry